Hello, everybody. Welcome into the Betting Pros Podcast. I am Ryan Warmly, joined today by my good friend, PJ Glasser of BetQL. PJ, how you doing, buddy? Doing good, Worm. Great to be here with you, man. Sweet 16 time. What a round of uh, 64, 32 that we had. I know it's a little chalky. I think it's only the fifth time ever that uh, all one and two seeds made it. And I know everybody wants upsets. They want some of the double-digit seeds to advance, but... Worm, these Sweet 16 matchups that we have, man, there are a lot of really, really good ones. So I'm, I'm looking forward to breaking it down. Yeah, I was going to say in, you know, kind of putting together the rundown that, you know, I was putting the seed numbers next to every team and it's all it's all ones, it's twos, it's four or five. There's not any double digit seeds outside of NC State. And not only are there not any double digit seeds, there's no eights, there's no nines, there's no sevens. It's all five and under plus NC State. So it's a lot of really highly ranked teams that should make for for a fun time. How did the opening weekend uh, treat your wallet? Well, it depends on what day you ask me. Thursday <laughs> was pretty good. Friday was excellent. Saturday was not good. And Sunday was not very good either. Uh, Friday was unbelievable. It was one of those days where, like, I don't think I got a bet wrong until St. Mary's to end the night. Saturday... I'm I'm usually a pretty heavy underdog type better because I usually like to fade the public. And as we all know, a lot of times favorites are usually where the public ends up going. So did not have a good day Saturday. Sunday, I, I had a pretty good day in the early session. I had Colorado, I had Clemson, and then I just absolutely got destroyed on Grand Canyon. So, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we had our good days, we had our bad. But uh, overall, I, I would say for the most part, probably pushed even. I wonder uh, how many people sort of had a similar, uh, you know, roller coaster of the weekend. Because I was the same boat as you. I was doing very well Thursday, Friday, uh, and then Saturday was like kind of a step down, and then Sunday was a big step down. And, and to a degree, it probably is because it was so many of these favorites, you know, not just moving on, but moving on comfortably in, in you know, a handful of cases that it's, those aren't the fun bets that people want to be making, you know, especially the early rounds of March Madness. So I wonder if, if a lot of folks were kind of in a similar boat. And that's the reason I asked you is because I was curious if you had kind of seen the same pattern play out, play out that I did. Did you have sort of like a biggest takeaway from the opening weekend? You know, was there a was there an outcome that, that you thought was most relevant to the rest of the the tournament or most surprising what was kind of stepping back 30,000 foot view what was your your biggest takeaway from the first four days yeah I'd say the biggest takeaway is probably just the ACC how, how impressive they have been right I mean eight and one so far this tournament their only loss was Virginia I know Carolina is a one seed so they got a 16 in the first round but being down double digits to Michigan State and then Worm coming back to take the lead at halftime. Like, it's not even like they came back in the second half. They erased that right away. Duke, after James Madison from the start, looked like the better team against Wisconsin. For Duke to just destroy them from tip to finish was extremely impressive. Clemson being underdogs in both of their two games, winning those outright. And then NC State, obviously, upsetting Texas Tech in the first round. And then facing Oakland, who was just on that magical carpet ride, and winning one of those games that it just had the feel like they weren't going to win. Oakland was doing the same stuff that they were doing against Kentucky, where every time it looked Kentucky would maybe pull away, Oakland would hit a shot to keep it close. They did the same thing. The fact that NC State was able to win that game, obviously that's their seventh, eighth game in 12 days. It went to overtime. It's just, it's pretty incredible for obviously the ACC at for so long being the conference in the sport. And now the last five, 10 years has kind of declined a little bit. They're certainly making a statement so far, putting uh, four teams in the Sweet 16. Please tell me you're not one of these people who's like, oh, maybe we were wrong about the conference being down just because they won a couple of games in the tournament. It, we, we can agree it was an, it's been an impressive tournament for them, but I hate the like retroactive like, oh boy, I guess we were really wrong about that conference all year when we had this huge sample size as opposed to like six games on one random weekend. Yeah, I mean, it's all matchups, right? Like the matchups that some of these teams get in are favorable to others and it's like a lot of these teams too, you know, the SEC and the Big 12, like they do have their top teams or whatever, like their Iowa States, they have their Houstons, they have their Tennessees, their Kentuckys, but a lot of those other teams are 
five, seven, nine seeds, right? So it's like they're playing in coin flip type games. So uh, I I agree with you. I think, you know, kind of making this statement of like, oh, now the ACC is the best conference in the sport. It's yeah. like they're having a great tournament. Maybe they're better than we thought they were, but I, I wouldn't, you know, go as far as to say like they're the best conference now. I'm pretty sure uh, on our preview show a week ago when the bracket was revealed that you said – NC State was your favorite double-digit seed bet to make the Sweet 16, and it turns out they were the only one to do it. So uh, kudos to you on that one. They now, I mean, after five games and five days in the ACC tournament, and now, you know, kind of a Cinderella run here in the NCAA tournament, now they finally have a chance to catch their breath here for a few days before uh, before getting into their Sweet 16 game. I want to ask you about those ones and two seeds. You know, you mentioned it's it's actually a pretty rare occurrence that they all make it to the Sweet 16. Uh, setting aside UConn because they were the favorite going in and unsurprisingly have looked very, very good. Was of the other seven ones and two seeds, was there one that stood out to you as, you know, that they're looking really maybe even better as a bet than I had anticipated or or one of them that, you know, they got through but maybe looked a little uh, iffier than you had thought they would? Yeah, I'll start with Purdue, Worm. We we all kind of know the stigma around Purdue, right? And Matt Painter's only been in one Elite Eight. He's never been in the Final Four. We usually don't see Purdue roll in tournament games like they did against Utah State. So for regular season Purdue to show up in a tournament game against a solid Utah State team, I thought that was, that was pretty impressive. And now you look against Gonzaga, they're five-and-a-half-point favorites. I think that line's going to be high to a lot of people. But I think that line is is pretty right on the money. So just seeing Purdue finally just handle an opponent that they should be, because they were favored by 11 and a half in that game. They were expected to win by double digits. For them to win convincingly by 40, I thought was uh, was really impressive. And then I'd say the team that I, I was a little disappointed in would be Tennessee. I just thought for so much of the year, Worm, that this year would be a little bit different. It felt like Connect was it finally a bona fide score that Rick Barnes had really never had at the guard position? We know the defense is going to be there, but for so much of the year, Tennessee was scoring in the 80s or 90s, and now we get to the tournament. They lose to Mississippi State in the SEC quarters. They play Texas in the round of 32. It's like a 62-58 game, and you're like, I mean, here we go again. It just looks like the same old Tennessee. So, both those teams are in the same region, impressed with Purdue, and then uh, disappointed with Tennessee. Yeah, I was going to mention in that region, you have Matt Painter, you have Eric Bards, you have Creighton, who's not had you know a lot of success in the tournament, all advancing through. So uh, a really interesting region to see, you know, unless it's Gonzaga, who obviously hasn't gotten over the hump later on in the tournament, unless it's Gonzaga, it will be somebody we talked about it in the preview that there will be an opportunity for these teams to finally break through. It will be one of them unless it's Gonzaga. So that that's a that's a really interesting region. Before we jump into the uh, bets, you know, in the Sweet 16, just one last question: Is there a region that you're most excited to watch to see how it plays out here? Uh, you know, in in terms of next weekend, is is it UConn's region? Is it Purdue's? Is there one that you're like, I'm really excited about the three games we're going to get in this region? Man, it's a good question. I, I would probably say I'm excited for that West Regional just because I, w I can't wait to see the offense in Bama, Carolina. I'm excited to see Arizona against Clemson, but then the potential of a Caleb Love game in Arizona and UNC. I think we were talking about that on the last yeah. podcast. Like the fact that we're two games away and Arizona and UNC went away from that happening, I, I think is, is pretty cool. From those two teams. I mean, again, where I'm like, we were talking about from the top, like, because this tournament is so chalky in terms of seeds and there's so many ones and twos and threes, it's like you can make a case for any of these regions. But for me, I think the storyline, I would say just Caleb Love being one of the best players in the country, going from a school like Carolina to Arizona and the fact that he could match up with his former school in the Elite Eight. I think that Carolina-Bama game is going to be awesome. I think Clemson-Arizona is going to be really good too. So uh, I'm, I'm excited for, for that region and see who comes out of it. I am really, really fascinated to see Iowa State versus Illinois you know, number one defense in Ken Palm versus number one offense in Ken Palm. Just the, the stylistic contrast is is going to be really fascinating. But to your point, you could really pick almost any of these matchups and 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 regions and say there are some there are a lot of really fun regional final possibilities. You know, for the Elite Eight, 
uh, kind of any way you slice it. I'm really su- – I, I was – Probably the biggest surprise for me in the Sweet 16 is is Clemson. I was very, uh, you know, much a believer in the, you know, very popular upset pick to the point that they were actually the favorites in New Mexico uh, over Clemson. So the fact that Clemson has now, you know, upset two teams, uh, I, that that's been a real surprise to me. But you know, you know, most of these matchups, like like if you had asked me at the start of the tournament, not what I predict would happen, but what would I want to happen? What would I want the Sweet 16 to look like? I think like. 13 or 14 of the teams that I would have said I'd like to see in there actually got there. And and I there was some, you know, tweeting and stuff going on on social media about, well, maybe it looks like a little less madness than there usually is in that opening weekend. But when you have, you know, fewer of these crazy wild upsets, we've, we've been saying it this whole time, it sets up for a super, super fun Sweet 16 and, and that second weekend of the tournament, which which is is it's not as fun as those first couple of days, but it's it's uh, sometimes a lot more compelling um, when you get into this round. So let's dive into how we're going to be betting the Sweet 16. We're going to go through region by region here and just hit on every matchup. So we'll just start right at the top with UConn. Obviously, heavy favorites going in. Nothing that we've seen that would make us you know kind of go against that. We have the rematch from last year here, UConn-San Diego State. So uh, how are you betting this one? I mean, for me, I think the bet in the game would be the San Diego State team total under. I, I think when we preview a lot of these game were, uh, these games where we're going to talk about how the spread is correlated to the total in some of these games, I think if you like the Aztecs here, you got to like the under. Like UConn has shown the ability to win games in the 90s and win games in the 50s or 60s, San Diego State is not. Like, they're not going to be able to beat UConn in the 80s or 90s. It's funny. They find themselves in the same exact spot that they did last season where they were in the Sweet 16 against the number one overall seed in the tournament when they played Bama, great offensive team, great defensive team, and they forced them to three for 28 from three-point range. Now, UConn's not going to shoot that many threes, but the idea is for San Diego State to pull off another upset, they're going to need UConn to just have one of their worst shooting games of the entire year, which that's what San Diego State is built to do. The problem is where is the offense going to come Their best player and one of the best big men in all the country is Jaden DeLee, but he's going up against maybe the best big man in the country, Donovan Klingon. So it's just a terrible matchup, right? SDSU had Matt Bradley last year, who was a big part of why they went to the title game. They don't have him. So just like, where is the offense coming from? I mean, you saw it with Northwestern yesterday, especially in the first half. I think that honestly might be the best play is if you can find a San Diego State team total under in the first half because UConn might be up 25-30 in this game and then San Diego State's kind of scores some garbage points and they go over their team total. So I like the full team total under for the game. But if you can find a number for the first half when UConn's obviously going to be fully into it, they're going to make life really tough for the Aztecs. I uh, When I look at that matchup, that's my favorite play. Do you have any interest in you know the, the spreads, 11 points on DraftKings, the totals 136 for the game? Any interest in those at all, or you're just primarily looking at the San Diego State line? You know what's funny, Worm? In these last two tournaments where UConn's gone 8-0 against the spread, I don't think I've bet them like a single time, right? Because <laughs> they've been like favorites in all these games, yeah. and these numbers are getting so big. And it's like, can they keep winning all these games by double digits? And they continue to do it. So, you know what? Maybe I will lay the 10 and a half with them just to see if they can win a sp- if they can well, win. Well, you know what's going to happen is as, as soon as you finally do that, that's when the streak's going to end. You know that's how it works. That's how it works. I, I can never bet an Iowa football under because yeah. I know as soon as I do, right? You'll it's just be like the guy 25 and a half. It. And as soon as I do, it goes over. Um, but yeah, I mean, if I had to play, it could only be UConn. I mean, San Diego State's yeah. not going to win the game. And in in March Madness, it's tough for me to bet dogs when I just don't think they're going to win a game because you're just basically hoping that the Aztecs can kind of win on a backdoor cover. And I just, I don't think that's a good way to invest your money. I think those team total unders, like we said, are good. Or if I had to make a play, it would be UConn with the points. Uh, let's go to the next matchup here. I, I mentioned it earlier. Iowa State, number one defense in Ken Palm. Illinois, number one offense in Ken Palm. Uh, they're both, a, uh, you know, top 10 teams overall. Ken Palm, obviously, Illinois, their defense is a lot lower. They're 92nd in Ken Palm. Iowa State's offense, 49th, just to give all the numbers there. Um, Again, 
stylistic contrast in terms of like strength on strength. I saw, I forget who it was. There was some other podcast I was listening to and the guy was saying, um, can we just like reset every possession? And if Iowa State stops Illinois, they get two points, but just only see this offense versus defense for the whole game, uh, which would be really uh, intriguing. You know, the line is something like two, two and a half. Uh, totals 146 and a half. What do you make of this one? Again, I mean, I can't, I can't say it enough that it's, it's just so fun to see, you know, the unstoppable force against the immovable object. I'm, I'm really giddy about this matchup. Oh no, no question. And again, I was talking about there are going to be some of these games where you correlate the spread with the total. Worm, this, this is the game. Like there, this is the dream matchup. If you like Illinois, you like the over. If you like Iowa State, you like the under. Yes. Like there's just, it's the perfect game. Like if you like Iowa State to win. Don't bet them to win. Bet them to win and bet the under or bet Illinois, vice versa. Have a lot of people. I have a feeling that a lot of people are going to like Illinois in this game just because more people are going to lean towards the offensive team that's more fun, that's more sexy. It's just, you know, the way that we're kind of wired. But this time of year, when we get later into the tournament, I'm going to always lean towards the defensive team. So if I had to pick the game, I would take Iowa State. It's not one of my favorites on the board, but – like I said, if there are people listening and they have a strong feeling, man, take take the over if you're with the Illini or the under if you're with the Cyclones. I'm actually with you on Iowa State. I, I don't know that I'm going to you know put too much on the game because I, I really just want to kind of sit back and watch and see how it plays out. Uh, but but you know if I was refilling out a bracket here, which I'll kind of ask us to do for the purposes of the show, I, I'm taking Iowa State, and obviously we're both taking UConn. So just to fill out this region – or would you say UConn, Iowa State, and then UConn over Iowa State? Would that be how you would forecast it? I know we talked a lot about you know UConn Auburn as being a really potential fun game. Uh, obviously, we, we didn't get that. Um, I was uh, I was convinced by you on last week's show to even sprinkle sprinkle in Auburn in some brackets over UConn, so that one hurt me. Uh, thank you for that. But uh, but UConn over <laughs> Iowa State is that, is that how we're kind of resetting this region? Oh, you and me both were you and me both. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would say UConn. UConn's definitely going to win. I think they're going to win regardless of who they play. I think if you're a UConn fan, you would rather see Iowa State. I think a team that's going to beat UConn Worm is a team that can score. So Illinois, to me, would be would be the tougher matchup. I do think it's going to end up being Iowa State, though, and, and I think UConn gets the win. Let's go to the next region here. Houston versus Duke. Uh, I know a lot of people were, you know, pulling for JMU. Didn't happen. Houston, obviously... You know, squeaking into the Sweet 16, uh, they were, uh, unless I'm forgetting a game, which is entirely possible because you just watch so much college basketball all in a row. I think that was the the closest call any of these ones or twos had, uh, again, unless I'm, I guess Tennessee was close in there. They're one against Texas, but a very close one, you know, uh, to get past A&M for, for Houston. Did that, does that scare you off of Houston going up against a Duke team that, as you mentioned, looked really, really good in dismantling JMU right from the start, or would you still kind of lean towards the one seed in this one? I think this is a great, great matchup for Houston. I really do. And the fact that this is a Sweet 16 game and not a round of 32 games so they can get some rest and they can prepare for Duke and watch some film. Worm, we know the script on Duke and how to beat them, and it's it's you rough them up. You get physical with them. They lost to Tennessee in the tournament last year. It's why they can't beat Carolina and Baycott. If they play in a game that's dictated by guards on the perimeter, Duke has to like that matchup. But going against Houston, until they can prove to me that they can beat a team that's physical, I can't back them. And you're getting maybe the most physical team in college basketball. So Houston really intrigues me. How many times, Worm, have we seen in this tournament where a team wins a survived advance game and then goes on to just win the whole thing, right? And it kind of feels like Houston, probably the last three or four years, they don't win that game against AM. They had four guys foul out, four starters foul out. He yes. still found a way to win. So there's something to be said about that. And what I like, too, about handicapping some of these Sweet 16 games is fading some of these teams that come in riding super high and some of these teams coming in off barely a win. Like, a lot of people are going to like Duke because of what they saw against JMU. A lot of people are going to shy away from Houston because of the collapse against A&M. But you got to understand it's a new round. It's a new site. There's five off days in between. And it's just a bad matchup for Duke. They have not shown the ability to beat physical teams. So I like the favorite in this one. I'd lay it with Houston. 
Couldn't you just totally see, like, in, you know, one shining moment, uh, if Houston wins it all, uh, just, you know, the walk-on coming in, clutch free throw late, Ryan Elvin, shout out to him, what a... That's the moment every walk-on could possibly dream of. I know he missed one of the free throws, but still got him uh, up four late in that one, you know. And they had no choice with all the, you know, the foul trouble that that they were in. Uh, yeah, that that line, uh, you know, four, four and a half uh, total, one thirty-four, one thirty-four and a half, depending where you look. Uh, it sounds like you would lay the points with Houston, and, and I'm right there with you. I think. Yeah, no question. It's just, it's all about the matchup. You know, it's all about the matchup. Each game is different. Duke clearly just, JMU just looks scared. You know, it's just all that confidence they had against Wisconsin. It just didn't look like the same team against Duke. They got on them early, but this is a new matchup. Houston kind of feels like they're playing with with new life. They probably should be out of the tournament. Now they move on to the Sweet 16. I think it's a great matchup for them against Duke. I always look really closely to, you know, highly ranked power conference teams that, uh, they played multiple double digit seeds to get to the Sweet 16. That is not a shot on JMU. They were very legitimate. Obviously, they were a really good team this year and, and quite possibly were maybe underseeded a little, although they didn't look like it in the round of 32. Uh, but, but whenever I see a team like Duke and, you know, they got through a 13 and a 12, I'm always like, okay, like now you have the real, you got the one seed coming up. That's a pretty big step up that you yep. haven't, you haven't like ramped up to. You didn't go 13, then a five, then a one. You went 13, 12, one. And, and it's a big step up even with the, uh, you know, the several days to prepare here. Um, on the other, you know, side in this region, Marquette versus that double-digit seed that we mentioned, NC State. Uh, Marquette is a team that I took to win a number of my pools as sort of uh, going against the everybody's going to take UConn or, or one of these one seeds. And, you know, Kolick coming back healthy, I was really excited about. He he has looked very good, you know, especially in that round of 32 game. Um, so Marquette against NC State. What are your betting angles on this one? So the way I'm approaching this game, Worm, uh, we've obviously talked about it, kind of how chalky this tournament is in terms of seeds. And what makes it really tough now is on all these survivor pools. I'm sure a bunch of people that listen are in a bunch of these pools. And if you look at the Friday games, right, it's Duke, Houston, Marquette, and NC State, Purdue, Gonzaga, and Tennessee, and Creighton. Of those four games, there is a clear clear choice for who 90% of people in their pools are going to take. And it's Marquette. And I've been doing these pools way too long (laughs) to know that when we get into this second weekend and everybody is on the same team, it usually doesn't work out well for them. And the dog that we're getting worm is this dog that is just playing with house money. Like we don't, we just, we can't understand how NC state keeps winning, right? ACC yeah. tournament, five games in five days, beat Duke, beat Carolina, beat Texas Tech. Oakland, obviously a favorable matchup in, instead of Kentucky, but look, credit to them for winning that game. Now, nobody's going to like them again against Marquette. Kolick looks healthy. Their offense looks great. But for me, that's the betting angle in this one. It's just, it's the survivor pulls, and you know when we get to a Friday, nobody's going to touch that Midwest region with Purdue, Gonzaga, Tennessee, and Creighton. Nobody's going to touch the Houston and Duke game because they're likely going to like the winner of that to beat the winner of Marquette, NC State, and it's all going to be on Marquette. And I think NC State has a great shot of winning that game outright. We didn't get that big, big upset in the round of 32, and this is really that game that would probably be the big, big upset because all these spreads are so tight. So I just look, NC State's hot right now, where we see it all the time in the tournament. Some of these teams just get hot. I, I like the Wolfpack plus the points. I take them on the money line as well. I was gonna ask, would you prefer plus six and a half on the spread against the spread or plus two thirty on the money line? Yeah, I think certainly take both, right? I mean, NC State, I could see this game coming down to the wire. Marquette, Colorado came down to the wire. Western Kentucky was up at half against Marquette. Shaka Smart, ever since he made it to the Final Four with VCU, has not been to the Sweet 16 until this year. It's his first time getting back. So, you know, he'd struggled in those first two rounds. It's not going to be easy for Marquette. NC State is obviously battle tested. They've played against some really good teams. And uh, I, I would certainly, the fact you're getting over the two full possessions, you're getting a key number there at six and a half. I, I like it. And getting a good money line price too at plus 230. So when you look at a, a Cinderella team like this NC State team is, do you see the break now between the round of 32 and Sweet 16 
as a benefit because, again, they've played so much basketball in the last two weeks that they now get a rest? Or do you see it as a detriment where this team is really hot and they might cool off a bit with the downtime? No, I, I think it's it's big for them to get that extra rest. Also, the fact that they played on a Saturday and now get to play on a Friday, right? They easily could have gone Sunday to Thursday, but the fact that they're going Sunday, they're going Saturday to Friday is is massive for that team. I think they're so confident. Right now, every time they take the floor, they think they're going to win. They just need their legs back underneath them because this is a team where Kevin Keats's teams like to press. They like to pick you up full court, and they still have been doing that, but obviously he has to pick and choose his spots knowing how fatigued his team has been playing so many games in a short amount of time. So to get essentially a full week off and, and to be able to play, and you're not going to have to get your guys to get up for a Sweet 16 game. So I, I think the rest certainly is is more important for NC State. So let's make an official pick for this you know region. We're both going to take Houston again, uh, you know, over Duke. Are you going to officially, if we were refilling out a bracket, go NC State over Marquette? I would. I would. Yeah, I have NC State and Houston in the Elite Eight. I like Houston to uh, make it to the Final Four. Nice, nice. I will stick with Marquette uh, just kind of because I have to because they were uh, they were my title pick, uh, you know, in so many of my pools. But uh, okay, so 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 far, two one seeds uh, from you in uh, you know coming out of each of these regions. Let's go to Purdue's region. Purdue, the one seed against Gonzaga, the five. This was a Gonzaga team I liked quite a bit. A because they've played well, you know, later in the season. But B, uh, it it's it's almost like a, too much of a narrative play, but just. Wouldn't it be great if this was the year for Gonzaga, like of all the years? Now, finally, everybody's, you know, writing them off down season. Nobody cares about them that they then go on, you know, the run to get over the hump. I, I doubt it'll actually happen, but it was kind of a fun, uh, you know, fun thing to be rooting for and uh, and that I did sprinkle in, in some of the pools as well. Um, but, you know, going up against Purdue, clearly, you know, a, a very intimidating matchup and a very intimidating big man in Zach Eady. Uh, what's your take on this one? Yeah, I like Purdue minus the five and a half. And I know a lot of people are going to like the Zags because of how they've looked in the first two rounds and because it's Purdue and we got into the Sweet 16. And it's like, even if you like Purdue to win the game, do you really want to lay five and a half with them? This line opened up at four and a half. It went up to five and a half. I think the public's going to be heavy on Gonzaga. I just, it, it, it feels like something's different with Purdue. It does. Now, I don't think they're going to win the national championship. I don't even necessarily think they're going to make it to the final four, but I do like this matchup with the Zags. These teams did play in Maui earlier in the year, but the Zags are a team that obviously they run such a good offense and their guards are very good, but they do try and get the ball inside to Watson and to Ike. And with Edie in the middle there, it's, it's obviously going to make life tough. So Gonzaga shot the lights out of the ball against McNeese state and against Kansas. They really haven't had their kind of dud shooting night yet. I think that could maybe be coming here. So uh, I'll lay the five and a half with Purdue. I think they're going to cover. Isn't uh aren't we shaping up for Purdue to maybe face the same field as they did in Maui in the same order? Cause they cause they they won over Marquette. I, didn't they go Gonzaga, uh Tennessee, Tennessee Marquette? Marquette? I think they did. So so, so we could get the same, you know, kind of stretch here from them if they were to make it to the uh, to the championship game and if they have all the same uh, you know, opponents there, that is possible. Something to look out for. Uh, you know, possibly happening. Yeah, I, I, I'm kind of of the opinion that uh, I think if it's close, I could see Gonzaga pulling it out. I think if Purdue wins, which I think they probably do, I think they win by by more than the five and a half. So I, I like, I like laying the points. If you think Purdue's gonna win, I think it's gonna be a situation where. Uh, you know, ED is just unstoppable where the shots are falling and they win by maybe even like double digits, which again, I do like this Gonzaga team quite a bit, but when Purdue is on, they are just, you know, I think you're right there. It feels like there, there's something different about them this year. Their next level is a level up just from most of the teams they face. And I think that's including Gonzaga. So if you like Purdue to win, uh, I'm definitely with you on, uh, on laying the five and a half for sure. Anything on the total 154 and a half. No, nothing there. Um, both teams have just been so good offensively, and both teams won't be afraid to run in the game either. Um, I don't know, Worm. You know what's what's actually crazy, and it might sound like kind of a silly take, but 
I get this feeling that when I watch a bunch of these games at the regionals, like, do you get the same feeling too, that some of these hoops are way more just like shooter friendly. It just looks like they're way better yeah. for scoring. Like the, the hoops that Purdue was playing on in Indy was a lot different. It felt like than in Salt Lake city and like they're both NBA arenas, but it's like they were using the hoops that the Pacers did. And then the hoops that they were using where the jazz play, it's just like the ball was getting stuck in the net sometimes. And it's like, what is going on? So like, yeah. as crazy it is to say, sometimes there are better hoops at like certain regionals and, when you get a total like that, I almost kind of want to see like what the hoop looks like before I bet a total. Like as crazy as that is to say, I just I feel like a lot of people listening like can understand what I'm kind of talking about. Yeah, and I feel like I feel like they always talk about like the softer rims at Maui. You know, usually get a nice friendly friendly roll right. and, and ba bounce there. I I totally get that. I, I'm with you. Sure, sure. So like you know, for, I would say for most of the regionals, like some of the hoops were were better. Um, these are obviously two great offensive teams. Um, and, and they're clicking. I mean, they're clicking right now. So I, I would probably lean towards the over, but. Man, 154 is is a lot of points. So I, I'd stay away. I think my favorite bet would, would be Purdue with the points. Both top seven teams in Ken Palm on offense there. Uh, let's go to Tennessee Creighton on the other side. You know, two versus a three. So obviously outside of Gonzaga, quote unquote, upset in Kansas. This is a very chalky region. Uh, Tennessee is a team that I have really loved all season. You know, the last, you know, short bit of the season that came down a bit but they're still a top three defense in Ken Palm Creighton is 11th on offense in Ken Palm so another bit of a stylistic clash here you know Creighton just has a reputation and I think they've lived up to that to a degree this year of you know this, this fun free-flowing offense aesthetically pleasing in Tennessee is very happy to muck it up. You know, I, there's been a lot of talk this year about how Dalton Connect is kind of that he, he's what makes Tennessee different this year but like you said, still getting into mucking it up so far in this tournament and, you know, kind of scraping by hard nose defense, all, all that classic stuff. Um, so how do you see this one playing out Tennessee versus Creighton? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned that free flowing offense that doesn't mind running and gunning and Tennessee this year. Obviously, they play in the SEC with a bunch of teams that can score. They played Bama twice. They played Kentucky twice. They played Florida. They played UNC earlier in the year. They played Wisconsin earlier in the year when their offense was really humming. They played Illinois like they have played a bunch of really good offenses this year, Worm. And more often than not, a bunch of those games were high scoring. Carolina game was 100 to 92. The Illinois game was 86 to 79. Both Kentucky games, 85, 81, 103, 92. The Bama game, they scored 91 and 81 points. So you're looking at these matchups. Creighton is better defensively than certainly Kentucky and Bama and are comparable to some of these other teams. But nonetheless, I mean, you're just looking at these Tennessee games and when they've gone up against teams that are really good on offense, have good shooters and can score, these games tend to, tend to fly over the total. So... Uh, it's a coin flip on that game. You could make a case for either side. Creighton, the thing that I've always said about them, Worm, is I think people's opinion on Creighton is it all depends on when you watch them. And the Oregon game was the perfect, it was the perfect like full Creighton experience. They go through five minute stretches where they can't make anything. And then they go through five minute stretches where they make everything and they get great looks. And it's just like, their shot variants. Sometimes they're on, sometimes they're not. And that's how they play. Um, but I, I like the over in this game. I think Tennessee is going to be able to score. And I think, uh, I think Creighton's going to be able to as well. So I'll take the over one forty three and a half. Yeah, I'm I'm somewhat interested in the Creighton money line, uh, just because I do think it's it's something close to a coin flip. And if you're getting plus money on on either of these teams, I'm that would kind of tend to be my lean. Um, I, I'm with you uh, on the total as well. Th that is that similar to Iowa State Illinois. That's just what I'm really excited to watch because I'm I'm really yes. I'm really fascinated to see how it plays out. Like I said, I've been I have really really been on board with Tennessee for for most of the season. And I'm like trying to not let just a uh, you know short stretch of games pull me off of that too much. I know obviously the conference tournament went as poorly as it could possibly go for them, um, but this is just a, one I'm very excited to watch. So give me your official picks for this region. It sounds like you know, I, and I would as much as I can zag. I'm with you on Purdue again, advancing to the Elite Eight. Who's your official pick on Creighton, Tennessee, and then can that team upset Purdue? 
Yeah, I I don't know. I mean, this <laughs> this is the region I'm the most I'm the more most turn on uh, torn on. Like I really like UConn out of the east. I like Houston out of the south. This one though, man. I, I mean, you could make a case for any of them. If you had to ask me today, I'll probably go with Purdue. I think it's either Purdue or Creighton. I think it's one of those. Um, Look, it's felt like all year in college basketball, there was a gap between Houston, Purdue, between UConn, and then Houston, Purdue, and then kind of everybody else. Like, those were the three number one seeds that were locked since, like, the beginning of February. And then we were kind of trying to figure out who that number one seed is. And the way that this tournament has played out, Worm, with all the ones and all the twos and all these threes advancing, and it's like... Only once have we ever had a Final Four where all number one seeds make it, but maybe that's like that's the direction that we're heading. So I, I think it's going to be a number, another number one. I would take UConn, Houston, and uh, I like Purdue out of the Midwest as well. Within this region, if you gave me Purdue versus the field, I would take the field, but yes, I don't agreed. know which one of them I would pick over Purdue individually. So it feels like I, you, you kind of have to take Purdue. It's a great point about how – there really was a, a clear top three this year. And outside of a scare against a and it's basically played out that way for these three teams so far. Um, again, Gonzaga plus Tennessee plus Creighton, I like their combined chances better than than Purdue's, but I just don't know which one I would I would take. Uh, I, I, think who, I think whichever of Tennessee or Creighton wins that game will give Purdue a game. Like, I don't think it's going to be something where Purdue steamrolls their way into the Final Four. But you can, you, I, again, I feel like you just have to take them against any of these teams individually. So I, I, I can't I can't push back against that, given what we've seen. I, I, I have a feeling they won't make it. But again, I, I'm not confident enough to say who would. Maybe Creighton would be my choice, too. But I, I I'm really not sure. Um, let's go to the to the uh, the last region here. Uh, UNC versus your Crimson Tide, uh, you know, one seed versus a four seed. This is another region that, you know, three of the teams are chalk, of course, Clemson being the other one uh, on this side of the bracket. But, uh, but you know, Carolina, Alabama, obviously, like your first thought is what a fun, you know, just back and forth offensive game this is going to be. Are you betting the total that way? I mean, it's like 173 and a half, uh, you know, is the first one I'm seeing. Uh, you know, the spread is just uh, it's just four and a half. It's a very high number. Um, but the way these teams play, you certainly it wouldn't be that shocking to see this be a huge high scoring affair. So, Worm, this Bama team is is historic, man. In the last 20 years, we had not had a team that was top 10 in offense, according to Ken Palm, heading into the tournament and 100 or worse. Make it to the Sweet 16. Bama becomes the first team to do so. And you can see why that trend is such a good one because teams, Kentucky was the other team. I, I was just going to say, Kentucky is the perfect example of why that usually plays out that way. Right, because we know there's so much chaos that happens in the first two rounds and these teams that are so good on offense almost always have an offensive stinker in their first two games. Kentucky's came in the first round against Oakland. They lost. Bama's came yesterday against Grand Canyon. And if you watch the game, I mean, Grand Canyon had every opportunity. They went to the foul line 37 times. They missed like 14 free throws. They couldn't make a three. They were up three points with like less than five minutes to go. They end up losing by 13. It was just, I've watched every Bama game this year, Worm. That was by far the best defense I've seen them play. And it's not even close. The intensity that they played with on defense in that game was, was truly impressive. But now that they've made it out of there and they've survived and they've made it to Carolina, like this matchup is kind of good for them. And their non-conference schedule, Bama has played five teams this year, Worm, that are in the Sweet 16. They played Arizona, Purdue, Creighton, Clemson, and Tennessee twice, obviously being in the SEC. So they're battle-tested. All of those games, the thing I would say, outside of them playing in Knoxville, the similar characteristic that I saw when Bama played all those top teams, they were great in the first half, and it was always high-scoring first halves. So when those numbers become available, look for Bama first half and look for the first half over 
as well. This line is similar to kind of what Michigan State was, three and a half, four and a half, depending on where you shop around. We know Michigan State was up 12 in the first half. I could see Bama jumping off to a really hot start too. Keep in mind, Bama just played in Spokane as well, Worm. So they're they're staying on the West Coast. They're going to be in L.A. Meanwhile, UNC has to travel across the country from Charlotte to L.A. So maybe, maybe a little advantage there for Bama, especially early on in the game. I do think Carolina wins um, just because Bama has not been able to beat a really good team this season away from home. They were fortunate. You talked about Duke playing a couple double-digit seeds. Bama did as well. Um, now that they're playing against one of the best teams in the country, I think they start hot. I think Carolina wears them down at the end. But Bama first half and the first half over are, are two plays that I like. Any, I mean, as a Alabama fan, any interest in, I mean, plus 165 on the money line for Bama, just as a, they, they could easily have another very hot shooting night and, and, you know, run with UNC and give them a game. And, and, and I, I agree with you, like filling out a bracket, like I would take the Tar Heels, but you know, at plus 165, I, I'm somewhat intrigued by that, uh, as a play on Bama. I agree, especially because Carolina is going to want to run with them, right? Like, that's that's the thing. The teams that are going to give Bama the most trouble would be the San Diego States, the St. Mary's, the, the Virginias back in the day, right? Like, the teams that are really good defensively and play at an ultra-slow pace. That's obviously why Oakland gave Kentucky so much fits. Like, that's what makes the tournament great, is we get this contrast in styles. I think it's why we're so excited for that Illinois-Iowa State game to see how Illinois deals with that. But we know North Carolina is going to want to run. They feel like they can run with Bama, and they can do it better than they can, and we know Bama's going to run. So it's a great matchup for them. I think there's going to be a lot of points. They had their off shooting night against Grand Canyon. I think they're going to shoot much better in this game. Latrell Wrightsell, who left for Bama, is going to be back in this matchup against Carolina. He's one of their better players. So, look, Worm, I, I certainly wouldn't talk you off of it, of the plus 165. I told you I like him the first half better, but now that they got past that game in the round of 32 that historically teams with their profile never do – it's almost like they're playing with house money at this point. Yeah. You know, Miami was such a bad defensive team last year. They kind of had their dud against Drake in the first round, if you remember. Got past that, and then here they go. Beat Houston in the Sweet 16. Beat Texas in the Elite Eight. It's like for these teams, when you're so good on offense, so bad on defense, you're going to have that one dud. If you can overcome it, then it's like, I mean, sure. In one game, can Bama's offense carry them over Carolina? They absolutely could. My favorite stylistic matchups in, uh, you know, March Madness are when it's cr a big clash, like we've talked about with Iowa State, Illinois, or when it's two teams that want to play the exact same way and who can do it better. And that right. is, you know, I, I think something we'll see play out in this matchup. Uh, last Sweet 16 matchup here, Arizona versus Clemson, the two versus the six. Again, I, I did not see Clemson coming because I was a big fan of New Mexico. Um, I So this was a definitely a surprise to me. Um, but as we talked about ACC kind of playing, uh, over what they had done throughout the regular season, uh, Arizona, a team that had disappointed under Tommy Lloyd, you know, not that many opportunities, but since he had come to Arizona from Gonzaga had been, you know, very successful in the regular season, not so much so in March to date now here in year three, uh, he, he's, uh, you know, he's certainly in the sweet 16, another good team. How are you betting this one? I like Clemson, plus the seven and a half. Another game where I think the matchup really fits the Tigers. So, we're in Clemson. I know they didn't have a great year in ACC play this year. They were only 11 and nine in ACC play, then obviously lost in the first round in the ACC tournament. A lot of people were down on them. But, man, if you go through Clemson's non-conference schedule and look at what they did, they beat UAB, they beat Boise, they beat Bama and Tuscaloosa, they won at uh, they won against South Carolina, TCU on a neutral. Like they were winning all these games against tournament teams in the non-conference. You're starting to see some of that show against New Mexico and Baylor. Something else they did was they beat teams that were great on offense and played at a fast tempo. They just played one against New Mexico in the first round, played a great offense in Baylor, beat Bama earlier in the year, as I mentioned. They beat Carolina, lost to Duke by one at Cameron Indoor this year. So there's something about Clemson when they go up against teams that want to play with pace and that are really efficient on offense. 
it always brings out the best in them. So there's nothing for me matchup wise. It should be a really good one for Clemson. We're getting a whole bunch of points here with the seven and a half Arizona. If you, if you put these teams side by side, power rating, all these different things, it's all going to point you towards Zona. The, the price probably is about right, but matchup wise, when you really dive into it and kind of who the teams this year, that Clemson's been successful against it's these teams with these high powered offenses. So I like Clemson to keep it close. I take them plus the points. Same question I asked you for NC State. Do you prefer plus seven and a half on the points or plus 260 on the money line? Yeah, so NC State, I think they can win outright. Clemson, I don't think they can. I think this will be a close game. So I would just uh, I would just take them plus the points uh, with the Tigers. What are our official picks for this region? All right, Warren, we're going to go North Carolina over Bama. We're going to go Arizona over Clemson, and then we are going to take Arizona over North Carolina. I think Caleb Love gets his revenge, so we're finally going to have a two-seed make it. I, I think was going to say finally great, not a one-seed. <laughs> finally not a one-seed. I do think Carolina's gettable. We saw a little bit of that with Michigan State. I think Bama's going to push him as well, and then Arizona's finally going to take him down. Arizona, it does feel like there's something missing with them, which is why I don't think they can win the whole thing. But really favorable draw, you know, getting Dayton when you probably should have gotten Nevada in that round of 32, getting Clemson when you easily could have gotten New Mexico or Baylor, who are both teams that are better on a sheet of paper. And then, you know, North Carolina, one game for for a winner take all. I think it's a good matchup with them. They play Bama. They already played them earlier this year. So to see a Nate Oates type game, to see his type of team, his type of style in person certainly helps them as well if they were able to draw them. So I think it's a good spot for for Arizona. I think they make it. So in the four regions, we have a one versus a two, a one versus an 11, a one versus a two or a three, probably the three, and then another one versus a two. And we've got the four, those first three ones. The three obvious teams, again, that we've talked about all season, UConn, Houston, Purdue, advancing, and then Arizona. As far as any team futures here to wrap up, uh, you know, UConn plus 200, this is to win it all. UConn plus 200, Houston plus 500, Purdue plus 650, Arizona plus 800. Then you get into UNC plus 1,000, Tennessee plus 1,200, Marquette plus 1,600, Iowa State plus 1,800, Duke plus 2,500, Gonzaga plus 2,500, Creighton plus 2,500, and then you're, you know, you're getting further and further down. Bama plus 4,000, Illinois plus 2,800, uh, NC State plus 10,000. Um, and I know I just ran through a bunch of those. I know you you know all those numbers as well, so I don't need to repeat them. Any, any futures stand out to you for, as far as an outright winner? I've told you Houston intrigues me just because I, I've seen it time and time again in this tournament when a team has a survived advanced game that they just they find a way to do it. Those teams go on to win the whole thing sometimes. So that was my pick preseason. The biggest question for me about Houston, we know game, they can win games in the 50s. We know they can win games in the 60s. Could they win a game in the 80s or the 90s? They showed us that they could do that against A&M. So now they've they've kind of checked off all my boxes. I'm, I'm going to continue to ride with them. I've mentioned I think Duke's a great matchup because Duke struggles with physical teams. I think they'll beat NC State in the Elite Eight. And then in the Final Four, they're going to get a great opponent out of the Midwest, and they're likely going to draw UConn in the title game. And uh, we'll see what happens. But certainly, I think the value at this point at UConn is gone. I mean, you've you missed the boat. You've had an opportunity to get bigger numbers, plus 200 right now, especially with all the top seeds remaining. Warren, what is it? We have like four, 13 of the top 14 Ken Palm teams that are in the Sweet 16. I, I've never seen anything. Yep. It's just insane. So, I mean, it, truly... You know, I know a lot of the times the NCAA tournament, we all love it. It's the best sporting event. But the one gripe with it is that you don't sometimes get the best teams. We really are like this year, which which is going to be awesome. And because of that, even though UConn clearly is the best team in years previous where there's more chaos and maybe I could justify a plus 200, I just I can't see that happening this year because they're going to they're going to have to go through just about every other good team in college basketball for them to repeat. Yeah, Auburn is the only outlier in the top 14 on Ken Palm that is, yeah. uh, you know, has been bounced. The only three teams not in the 14 on Ken Palm that are still alive are 17th San Diego State, 23rd Clemson, and then of course NC State down at down at 53. But yes, it's very very top heavy here. Um, ju- just quickly, because I- I'm looking at Marquette plus 1600. 
it, I know we th- think that Houston would beat NC State. What would you make of a Houston Marquette Elite g- Eight game, and how might you see that playing out? Because if Marquette does kind of end the Cinderella story again, I just love that that they have the best point guard in in pretty much every game they play. I, if I'm looking for value, I'm not taking anybody that's facing UConn before the championship game because I just think UConn is is so good that I'm trying yeah. to avoid that. So I'm looking at somebody on the right side of the bracket and Agreed. I can't bring I can't bring myself to say Purdue. Um and then since I don't know which of those other three teams in that region, that's why I'm looking at that Houston Marquette potential matchup as where I kind of would see the most value. How would you see that playing out if they were to meet? So, I think it's a good matchup offensively for Marquette because we know Houston's going to pack the paint. They're going to allow you to shoot threes. Marquette is a team that is go always going to have four shooters on the floor. They're going to spread it out. Kolick is so good at directing traffic. However, I think on the other side, Houston is going to eat them up on the glass. Like Marquette really doesn't have too much size out on the floor. Igadar is kind of like a 6'9", 6'10", hybrid, right? He's not your traditional post-up player who blocks shots and gets rebounds and all these kinds of things. And that's such a big part of Houston's offense. So I think Houston would get Marquette in a ton of foul trouble. If Marquette's hitting their threes, they would have to hit about 13 or 14 threes in that game. That's one of those games where they would have to play lights out, um, which they certainly could. They're that they're that good offensively to do it. But uh, I would like I would like Houston in that matchup. If I am picking that other region as a you know, sort of long shot, Creighton plus 2,500 too as sort of like a 2016 Villanova, just they get really hot and can't miss for a few games in a row, like possibility, um, you know, at, at that value. Because I that is a team that I could see upsetting Purdue, uh, you know, assuming they get past Tennessee and, uh, and just kind of getting hot and going on a run at that value. Obviously, UConn is like the likely team and and that's why there's no value there uh any other uh bets we didn't hit on that you want to mention no nothing else i think i think we've covered all of it i'm just i'm excited for these games Uh, so many so many good matchups um yeah i'm i'm interested to see i think the most is if nc state can keep it going right they're kind of the one outlier of everybody yeah and uh I just know everybody's going to like Marquette in that game and all their survivor pools. And I think NC State's got <laughs> yeah. a great shot at winning. So I'm excited to see what happens. If, if pretty much any situation that plays out in the Sweet 16, we are going to have a superb Elite Eight and a superb Final Four. It's It no will be doubt. very difficult for it to not be a really, really fun combination of teams. PJ, thank you so much for taking the time, buddy. We'll, uh, we'll hopefully get together again next week for some Final Four preview as well. Um, where can everybody listen to your stuff uh, throughout the week as you continue to just talk NCAA tournament nonstop for three straight weeks? Yeah, it'll be a lot. We're doing a lot of shows. You can catch me on the BeckQL Network. I do my show 1 to one thirty p.m. Eastern Time, Mondays through Fridays. Um, 30 minutes, no commercial breaks. It's interactive, so people that tune in can ask questions and bets and comments. I'll be filling in on You Better You Bet on Tuesday and Wednesday as well on BeckQL, and then uh, on BeckQL Daily on Thursday and Friday. also have a Sunday show, Sunday's Bets, that you can catch me there as well, 12 to 4 p.m. Eastern Time. So, Busy, busy time of the year, Worm. Wouldn't want it any other way. It's best time of the year, best sporting event. And, uh, man, we got we got a fun Sweet 16. I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a blast. Thank you again for coming on. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. He's PJ Glasser. I am Ryan Wormley. We'll see you again next week. <laughs>